Okay, so we are going to be talking about the respiratory system. And um, this is a little bit of a longer PowerPoint. And so what I'm going to do is divide it up into several shorter uh, lectures. So, um, so this is part one. And um, when we talk about respiratory system, um, we've, we've talked about this some because we've talked about the cardiovascular system. And that's how um, body systems are going to work together to get oxygen and carbon dioxide to different places. Um, so it serves as that transportation. So now we're going to learn about how, how does our body pull that oxygen in and how are we able to get rid of carbon dioxide um, that we no longer need. So what we see with respiration is that there's four processes involved. And uh, the first being um, this pulmonary ventilation. Okay, so pulmonary we know means lung, right? So if we have kind of our little drawing of our person here, <laughs> And we have trachea, you know, maybe coming down and bifurcating into left lung, and then this would be right lung here. Pulmonary ventilation is going to allow us to, um, I was wondering if I could change the color of my pen, maybe I can't, um, pull air in um, oops, through, our, through our nose. Okay, so we're going to breathe in air, it's going to travel down our trachea and down into one lung uh, and the other lung. So that's, that's the step one, that's pulmonary ventilation. We've got to get the air in. Um, our second step is going to be external respiration. And so we know what we have are um, capillaries that are going to surround the alveoli in the lungs. And we don't know much about that yet because we haven't gotten there. but we need to be able to move oxygen and carbon dioxide from the lungs themselves into and out of the bloodstream. And so we're going to have blood vessels that are going to come really close to the alveoli. And obviously this is kind of a um, not the most detailed drawing in the world, but the oxygen that we have in here that we've breathed in, we now need to get into our bloodstream. And then the opposite is true for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide that's in the bloodstream needs to be able to move into the lungs. And so we call this process external respiration. So that's kind of stage two. Um, stage three is going to be transportation. So basically, as those, um, as that, um, those vessels travel throughout our body, we're going to... Um, be able to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, to all the tissues and cells of the body to be used um, or to be excreted as waste product. So we kind of draw like our little, here's my cells here, let's say, and this would be kind of, you know, cells of the body. But what we have is, um, I'm sorry, I've got guinea pigs and they're like super excited about me talking down here. Um, so oxygen that is in the bloodstream is going to travel into the tissues of the body. Okay, so that's going to happen by diffusion and then carbon dioxide that is being given off as a metabolic waste product of the tissues is going to then diffuse into the bloodstream. And so um, we've got transportation of, of those gases. And then this process of internal respiration, which is happening here, right? Diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide um, between tissue cells and, and the blood, okay? So here's, here's our four processes here. And we're going to break those down and talk about them in a little more detail. Um, so when we look at the just anatomy of the, of the respiratory system, we can divide the respiratory system into an upper respiratory tract, which is basically going to begin, you know, we're breathing air in through our nose and, you know, air can come in through our mouth as well. Um, so nose all the way down to um, the pharynx is going to be considered this upper respiratory tract. And then as we travel down a little further, we get into the larynx, which is going to start about here. That's your voice box. 
um, and we travel down, you know, and into lungs, this is going to be our lower respiratory tract. Okay, so we can divide it into into two big picture um, sections. What does the upper respiratory tract do for us? So what are the functions of the upper respiratory tract? So for one thing, it's um, responsible for filtering the air that we breathe. Um, we don't want to breathe in pathogens or dust or pollen, that sort of thing. So we've got this lining of mucosa um, in our upper respiratory system that's going to help trap some of those pathogens so that we don't inhale them into our lungs. That mucosa is also responsible for warming and humidifying um, the air that we breathe. So um, mucosa is highly vascularized, so it's warm tissue, and as the air passes through it or by it, it's going to increase the temperature of the tissue. Um, the upper respiratory system also creates a resonating chamber for speech. So if you think back when we did um, the skull um, fall semester in um, for skeletal system, we have um, sinuses in our skull, which not only make our skull lighter, but they also kind of resonate our voice. So that's a function as well. And then um, upper respiratory system is a location of olfactory receptors. So what does olfactory mean? It means smell, right? So we've got smell receptors in our nose um, that are going to um, convey that information up to the olfactory centers within our brain. Okay, so a little more detail about this. So now we're in the nasal cavity now, so we're looking at this, you know, this area here. And I just pulled out a few things that I thought were important and some things to tie in with some information that you've learned before. So um, we do have this respiratory mucosa, so this um, mucus lining that covers all of this. And we have bony projections within our nasal cavity. And we've actually got three of them. And these are called the superior, middle, and inferior nasal concha. You might remember these from skeletal system last fall. But here's our superior, here's our middle, and here's our inferior nasal concha. And these were like ridges of bones um, that kind of stick out. And the whole point of these is to... Um, number one, increased surface area. So they're covered with mucosa and they increase surface area for the air to come into contact with as you're breathing it in. So it's got more access to the air. It can warm it and humidify it. Um, and also part two of this is the air has to travel along these bumpy ridges in your nose and it creates turbulence. So that basically like, um, um, mixes up the air so that it has more air in contact with the mucosa. So again, more access to warming and humidifying. Um, and we are also able to do the flip side. When you breathe air out, um, we don't want to lose a lot of the moisture in our humidified air that's been in our body. So through the respiratory mucosa, we are actually able to reabsorb some of that moisture. Just it's kind of interesting too. So we reclaim some of that. Okay. Um, you have these glands in your nose um, and these are called seromucous glands. And I thought these were kind of interesting facts. So um, basically it's a lot of mucus. You secrete about a quart of mucus each day. I mean, that's four cups of mucus. So coming out of your nose every single day. Um, one of the things that this contains this mucus. It contains an enzyme called lysozyme, and that's an antibacterial enzyme that helps to um, rid the air you breathe of bacteria. Um, it also secretes defensins, which are natural antibiotics that your body um, creates. Um, these seromucous glands, again, they play a role in humidifying the air that we breathe um, because they have a lot of water in them. And then they also have cilia. So you've got the little cilia, you know, that are going to um, basically be able to move. And so what happens with them is we're secreting the mucus into our nose. Those cilia are moving to actually move that mucus um, back to the back of your nasal cavity where you end up swallowing it. So, and we do that all day, every day.
So a um, couple more things with these um, seromucos, sero, seromucosal nasal glands is that they have um, sensory nerves. So they're, they're highly innervated. And when those nerves get irritated, that's when we end up sneezing. So that's what happens with that. And then um, again, like uh, we talked about a couple slides ago, they are highly vascularized. So they've got a rich blood supply, um, which makes them or allows them to be able to warm up the air that, that passes by them. So I thought some of that was interesting. Um, here's a little bit. I just did want to remind you of these, sorry, um, of these sinuses. And here are, you know, here's an anterior view of the sinuses. And we've basically got uh, four paranasal sinuses that we've talked about before. And here they are again. So um, frontal sinus located in the frontal bone. We've got ethmoid sinus. Um, if we go posterior to that, you can see on this view, here's our sphenoid sinus um, and then maxillary sinus. Um, which is going to be kind of right above the upper part of your teeth. So um, these sinuses are named for the bones that they're located in. All of those bones are ones that you're familiar with. And um, as we learned previously, uh, those sinuses are there to help lighten up your skull. They also help with voice resonance, like we just talked about. Um, and then also, because they're covered in um, a mucosa, they are... Um, they play a role in warming and humidifying the air that, uh, that they come into contact with. Okay, as we travel down, so we've done nasal cavity. So that's that. The next section that we're going to come to is going to be this area right here. And this is kind of what we think of as our throat. Um, and the technical word for that is going to be our pharynx. Okay. And what we've done is we can actually divide the pharynx up into three different segments, all contained within the pharynx, but we can actually you know, subdivide them a little bit. So we have um, a nasopharynx, which is going to be towards the posterior um, aspect of the nasal cavity. We have the oropharynx, so think oral for this. Okay, So it's going to be like towards the um, posterior aspect of the of the mouth, and then laryngopharynx, which is this part down here in green, um, as we travel on down towards the larynx. So they are in order, and that order kind of makes sense based on based on their names. Um, let's talk a little bit first about the nasopharynx. So that first uh, that first region of the pharynx. So we're basically up here. So what I've done is I've kind of teased out some things that I think are important um, in these areas. So um, this is going to be posterior to the nasal cavity and our um, um, tissue type in this area is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Okay, so what does all that mean? Pseudostratified? I've got a jumpy mouse. Um, pseudostratified, so it means that it appears to be stratified, but it's really not. Okay, ciliated, so we know that there's cilia um, involved here, which makes sense because we've got all that mucus coming down. Um, columnar, so that tells you the shape of the um, epithelial cells. Okay, so when you hear that, put it all together so it kind of makes sense in your head. Um, what's kind of interesting here is that air is the only thing passing through here. So as we breathe air in from the environment, it's going to come in and travel this way. So really, at this point, nasal cavity and the nasopharynx, air should be the only thing there. And the reason for that is because we have this little flap of tissue here. Let me, let me just highlight that a little bit. This little um, flap of tissue here is called the uvula. Okay, and so what we have, this is just a um, little flap of tissue off of your soft palate, um, which is in the posterior aspect of your palate here. And when you swallow, the uvula moves superiorly 
So that food that you're bringing into your oral cavity isn't able to travel up into your nose. We don't want that to happen. So that uvula is going to block um, entry into the nasal cavity. Okay. So theoretically, um, nasal cavity and nasopharynx should just be air. Only air traveling through there. Some other highlights. So again, we're in this, you know, area of our um, of our upper respiratory tract. We have what's called the eustachian tube. Okay, also called the pharyngotympanic tube, and you definitely need to be familiar with both. Um, but it does have a couple different names. So, and what we see there is this little opening um, between the nasopharynx and the middle ear. And so basically this is what gets blocked up when little kids get ear infections. Um, this tube, when you're, when you're little is more horizontal. So like if we had our tube, like, let's say this was our, you know, middle ear. And then this was our nasopharynx. This drawing probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's pretty flat. Like the tube is pretty flat when you're little. And so if it gets backed up with a lot of excess mucus, there's nowhere for it to drain. But as we grow and our faces um, elongate, um, we see that that tube becomes more at an angle. And so um, excess mucus that might build up in it actually can drain out, um, which is what we want to see. So um, anyway, just tie that in. You may have known little kids who've had ear infections or you may have had ear infections um, when you were little. Um, so another highlight in this area too are these little guys here. And these are the pharyngeal tonsils. And so basically what we have here are um, tonsils are collections of lymphoid tissue. And so they're able to basically trap any kind of pathogen that you breathe in through your nose and they're going to trap it there so that it doesn't enter um, your lower respiratory tract. And so this is the first collection of tonsils that we that we get to in this process. These are called the pharyngeal tonsils. They are also called your um, adenoids. So if you or someone you've known has had um, an adenoidectomy, ectomy means to take it out. So that means that they've gone in and had their adenoids or pharyngeal tonsils removed. Okay, these guys can become problematic if they get really swollen and they can block your breathing and cause you to snore and that sort of thing. So that's um, the first collection of tonsils there. Okay, now traveling down, we are down to our next section of the pharynx, and this is going to be the oropharynx. Okay, oro means oral, right? So we know we can pair that up with the oral cavity. So what do we see here? So for one thing to keep in mind, um, oropharynx is going to be a common passageway for food and air, right? Because we've got air coming in through our nose and traveling down. We've also got food coming in through our mouth and traveling down this area as well. So as a result, our tissue type is going to be stratified squamous epithelium. So we've just transitioned to um, a pseudostratified in the nasopharynx to now having stratified tissue. So why does that make sense? Why, why would we want to have stratified tissue in this area, if you think about it? Well, do any of you guys like really hot coffee or really spicy food? Um, you like sriracha? I do. I put sriracha on everything I can. I like my coffee like really, really hot. So it makes sense because everything that we do, when we do things like that, when we eat spicy food or we eat hot food, it's going to abrade that tissue um, in our mouth and we need to have protection. And so if you remember when we talked about different types of um, epithelium, if it's stratified, it's going to be in an area of increased abrasion, right? And so it makes sense here because we do have food traveling down this area as well. So that is a really nice example of complementarity. 
Um, also in this area, we have two more collections of tonsils. We have the palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils. So where are these guys? Um, what we see here are our palatine tonsils are going to be here. Okay, so here's our palatine tonsil. And these tonsils are, if you, if you open your mouth and you look back on either side at the very back of your oral cavity, those are your palatine tonsils, okay? So if you've ever had um, a, an infection or even strep throat and you've looked back there and you've seen those tonsils, they get kind of whitish looking um, and kind of gunky. Those are palatine tonsils. And then the other um, set of tonsils are your lingual tonsils. Lingual means tongue. And so that's gonna be this collection of tonsils here because this big thing here is your tongue, right? And so right at the base of it is going to be a collection of tonsils there called your lingual tonsils, okay? And these guys do the same thing. They're still lymphoid tissue and they're still responsible for capturing um, pathogens that you, that you inhale. Let's see. Okay, let's get through laryngopharynx. Um, so this is our third uh, part of the pharynx. We're coming on down. We're now down to this area here. This is laryngopharynx. Again, this is also a common passageway for food and air. So we've got air traveling in through here. We've got food traveling in and it's gonna travel on down. So it would make sense, complementarity wise, that we have stratified squamous epithelium here again. Okay, um, laryngopharynx, there's not a whole lot going on here. It's basically just a pathway um, leading us down to, um, it's actually going to kind of divide into two different areas. So if we go um, anterior down this passageway, we are in trachea going to lungs, right? And if we continue to go down posterior, posteriorly, we are going to stomach, okay? So um, trachea is gonna be anterior and esophagus heading down to the stomach is gonna be the most more posterior structure. 